And I tell you what a privilege it is to know that God's hand is upon your life. I don't even know why he wanted to save an old sinner like me, but I am so thankful that he did. You know, uh, I tell everyone all the time that I believe that God got Tom's wife mixed up with my sister. My sister Molly was the one that was always so well read in the Bible, who could give you the scriptures, who could mostly give you the comfort. But I don't know why God paired us up the way he did. But I'm very thankful he did. I'm thankful he has that calling upon our life that somehow, in some way, that we can help you all in any way, whether it be a phone call, a prayer, a tear, or just to pat you on the back and tell you we love you. But I am so thankful that God has his hand upon my life. And I look forward to the day that I'll just lay down maybe and sleep and wake in his new heaven. What a blessing that would be. And I tell you this morning, Charlie, my cup runneth over. I think I need a gallon bucket this morning. But I praise you all forever. And thank you for your love and your prayer. Amen. 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 Glad to be sheltered in the arms of God, aren't you? Amen. Brother Bill's been talking to us on Wednesday nights about the rapture or that snatching away of the church. And we understand the Bible tells us that in the latter days that there's going to be what we've known as perilous times before the coming of our Lord. We understand that. And, uh, but we also need to understand that the culprit behind these perilous times will be Satan himself. And so as we look at that, I want to think about the next few weeks of how that we want to look at why the church needs to experience victory here and now. Now we, we understand that the church will be victorious in the end. We know, we know that for sure. But yet we see we can see victory now. And we need to we need to strive for that. And and so the church is is affected by these latter days of perilous times and uh, uh, we can we can think and look back many for many years and see how the, the church has been affected by things that go on in our world today and so what I want us to look at is in, in the next few weeks of how that the ways that the church is affected through these times but, but I want to begin first of all uh, with a message this morning uh, looking at the one behind these perilous or dangerous times and uh, I want us to see the aggressiveness of Satan. So if you would please stand with me and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And uh, actually I want, I, I, actually I changed my mind, I want to look at verse 1 to begin with. Okay? Because I think that's important. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I, I, am, I, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Now listen. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the, de the devil, is like a roaring lion going about seeking those whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So he says to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary or your enemy, the devil is as a roaring lion going about seeking those whom he may devour. Thank you. You may be seated. As I was thinking about and praying about this message and praying along these lines, I guess the first thing that came to my mind was, as I was praying about this, is that we have to answer some questions. First of all, do I really believe that Satan is real? Absolutely, yes. Right. I want you to know that. I know that we, we, there's a, a lot of 
thing goes around in this world today that Satan is not real. And I think that uh, hey, the Bible plainly teaches of his reality. And you'll find in the Old Testament in Genesis and Chronicles and Job and in Psalms and Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, they will teach you that Satan is real. Jesus, many times in the New Testament, would talk about the devil or Satan, if you will, his reality. And I think that people get a picture of him. Uh, you know, I, I realize as we grow up, we see this, this man in a red suit and, uh, and horns sticking up and a pitchfork and a long tail. And we're taught probably that, well, that's the picture of the devil. But that is nowhere near the picture of Satan. Satan is, matter of fact, we'll get into that in just a moment, but, but Satan is a, uh, he's really, when you picture him in Ezekiel, we'll look at that in a moment, but he's pictured as a lovely individual and one who can entice and his beauty upon him. But yes, I believe he is a real creature. Over in Ezekiel chapter 28, chapter 28 and verse 11 says this, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone which you're covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pots was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the, you were the anointed cherub who, who covers. I established you. You were on holy, the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You become a horror and shall be no more forever. I think as Ezekiel is writing this and, and picturing in a sense a, a picture of what Satan is really like. As I said, so many times we think that he's just that man in that, in that red suit and the horns and the pitchfork and these things. But you can see here that he's described as one who is beautiful, one who is enticing. One who can take good things and make them bad. And God said, because of your pride, He said you're going to be cast out. You were cast out of the mountain of God. You were cast from God. You see, God, you know, when you look at Satan and realizing that, that he was there with God, and because of his greed and because of these things, again, his pride, he said, I want to be like God. So therefore, he had to be cast out. He's cast out in two. And we see him... We see him here upon going about on the earth, going about to and fro, and seeking those whom he may devour, enticing things. Enticing, as I, I look at that, I realize that you know he is called, he is called Satan. He is called the devil or the the, the abelos, if you will, or that slanderer. That's what devil means, is that, that slander. He's called the evil one. He's called the serpent. He's called the great red dragon. He's called the old, old accuser. He's called the tempter in God's word. He's called Beelzebub, which means the chief of the demons. He's called Belial, which means worthless or wickedness. So yes, I do believe that Satan is real. And I do believe that at one point he's, he learns how to control the hearts and minds of individuals. That's his job. He does that. I realize that there used to be the Flip Wilson show. Some of you young folks have no idea who that is, and that's okay. I heard about it. <laughs> but he'd always say, the devil made me do it. Now you've got to understand that even though Satan is so real, that he cannot make you do anything, but he can entice you to do a lot of things. He can, he can make things beautiful. I, I was thinking the other day, as a matter of fact, I was sharing this the other day. You know, we, we, he takes good things and makes bad things out of them. 
Uh, television, you know, people say, oh, television is so bad. Well, we understand the programs on there are so bad at times. But television was a good thing. You could watch Andy Griffith. 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 I mean, you could watch some good programs. But we also see how that the devil has creeped into Hollywood and all these places. And now you see a lot of things on there that's not worth turning the TV on for. You look at the computer. The computer is a very good source of information. But look what the devil has done. He has turned it and made something bad out of it. Because when you think about computer, oh boy, there's terrible stuff on there. The other problem is. But that's his way. He takes things that are good and makes them bad. And he tries to do that with individuals. He entices folks. I, I begin to think of how he's, to, you know, how Satan begins to, to take our children a lot of times away from us. We were, we, we were talking about some bicycles. The guy and I were talking about some bicycles. And, and, uh, he, and he said, well, he said he had about eight or ten of them. A friend of mine did say he had about eight or ten of them. He has a flea market, goes to the flea market. I've got eight or ten bicycles. He said, but you know what? I can't sell them. He said, kids don't. He said, they just don't ride them. I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll invent something that we can put a keyboard or a pad on the handlebars. And I said, if we can do that to where they can have access to the computer while they're riding, you'll sell a lot of bicycles. Because that's what it's come to. You understand that? So, so Satan then entices our children to, to get away from God and to get away from parents and do all these things. And they... You know, they, 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 Satan encourages them and entices them with drugs and alcohol and says only once, just do it one time, that's all that's necessary. Then one time leads to two, two to three, and it keeps on going. That's what Satan does. He's real, folks. He is real. <coughs> so he's a powerful, intelligent, clever, and so we must never forget or underestimate the reality of our enemy. The reality of our enemy. Hmm. I was thinking what a fellow said one time about two men boxing. And this one guy was getting the tar beat out of him. Getting the daylight beat out of him. And the guy in the corner said, his corner man said, hey, don't worry about this. There's nobody in that ring but you and the devil. He said, well, the devil's doing a pretty good job of hitting me because somebody's wearing me out. Uh. Well, that's where the devil is. He'll wear you out. So the second, yes, do I believe he's real? Absolutely. The second thing I thought out, yeah, do I believe that Satan is really a slanderer or a liar? And yes, I do, do because over in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is talking to the people there, and they were talking how good they were. And they said, but our father is Abraham. And so they go on and tell him, and Jesus says, listen, if you were of your father, you would be doing the things of your father. But he goes on down and says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> says to them, he said, listen, he said, your father is the devil. And he said, your father is a liar and he's the father of lies. He said, the father of this world is who you are following. That word lying means slandering. So yes, he is a liar. He will tell you one thing, but he gets <laughs> It doesn't come out the way, it doesn't pan out the way he says. And so I thought about that, and I realized that Satan even slandered God in the Garden of Eden. Remember, remember there in chapter 3, as, as God had told Adam and Eve, he said, Listen, I prepare this garden for you. It is beautiful. You'll have everything that you need here. He said, You can eat of every fruit of every tree. Except the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. And he said, the day that you do that is the day that you will surely die. Well, guess what? <clears throat> Here comes along that slanderer, that liar, that deceiver. And the woman is there in the garden and perhaps it would go something like this. I'm not admitting, but perhaps it would go something like this. He'd say, how you doing, pretty lady? You like some of this fruit? She's all about, I can't have that. Because God said, the very day that I do that the day is the day that I'm going to die. But you know what he says? Oh, don't worry about that. He's saying God, in a sense, he's saying God is a, a jealous God. 
And God is a jealous God. But he's saying, don't worry about that. He's just telling you that. He said, you want to be like God? You want to know everything there is to know and be like Him? And she might say, that'd be cool. I can do that. He said, well, all you got to do is eat this fruit. Eat this fruit. So here he is slandering God. He's lying. <laughs> so then we see that she takes that, that fruit and said, oh, that at the very moment she did, her eyes were open. Thank you, Lizzie. You know, she only gave me a little bit, so I wouldn't preach too long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the thing about it is that her eyes were open and she realized something. She realized that she was naked, had no clothing on. <laughs> I was flipping through the channels the other day. Do you realize there's a program on TV that says dating naked? <laughs> you realize that? We were in our doctor's office not too long ago, and our doctor said, Hey, Tom, have you seen that, that program of uh, Naked and Afraid? I said, No. He said, Well, y'all check that out. I said, What do you mean? He said, They're out on this island together, man, and they're naked and they're afraid. Duh. Uh. <laughs> naked and afraid. <laughs> Dating naked. But here, she had no idea she was unclothed. But the devil said, if you'll do this, your eyes will be open. And so her eyes were open. She said, oops, I don't have any clothes, so I'll be back. So she runs to her husband. She gives him that fruit and said, here, take this. You eat this. He did. <clears throat> then they realized that they didn't have any clothes on. Well, anyway, you know there's just a story. God came to them in the cool of the day and said, where are you? We're over here hiding because we're naked. Who told you that? Well, uh, the, Adam, of course, says, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, he made that pretty specific. Mm -hmm. The woman you gave me done that to me. Well, she said, well, that serpent out there that you made out there, he's the one who told me. Blaming everybody else, you know how that goes. When you, when you sin, you, you, it's always somebody else's fault. It's never yours. It's never yours. It's somebody else's. Wow. Their eyes were so he became a slanderer to God, of God. You'll be just like him. God just doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want you to know anything. God just wants you to be right in this little area and do nothing else. But that's not what God wants. We know that. God wants to bless us and God wants us to be, as the old army slogan says, to be all that we can be with him. Amen. Everything. He slandered God. He slandered man there in the book of Job. He really did. When the, it said that there came a day when the sons of God and, and all these things came together and the Satan was there and he said that he came to him and, and uh, uh, Job uh, being part of all this, you know, and Satan came to, to, the, to the meeting, <laughs> if you will, and said to, to the Lord, he said, you know what? He said, look at your servant Job. The only reason that Job is trusting you is because of the fact that you have given him everything. You've given him all these children. You've given him this land. You've given him all this, uh, the, the, the sheep, the cattle, everything here. You've given him. So that's the only reason that he's serving you. Well, <clears throat> he was trying to convince the Lord of that. So he was slandering man. So <coughs> Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? He doesn't fear you because of who you are. But... He said, you made, Satan said, you made a hedge around him and his household. He said, in a sense, he said, you take that away. And I guarantee you, he says, that man, that Job will quit serving you. Well, get this. So the Lord told Satan, he said, all right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. To show you that you are a liar, that Job is going to serve me regardless. I'll take the hedge from around him. And I'll give you power over him to do anything you want to. But you remember this. His soul belongs to me. God done that. So we see what Satan done. Satan began to destroy and take everything that he had. He, be, he began to destroy everything. But you know what? Finally at the end, Job said, through all of his losses, through all of his sickness, his pain he went through, Job says, I know my Redeemer liveth. Right. So Satan slandered man. He lied to him. Oh, lied about man, of what he would do. He's lied about God. 
Now look over in Matthew chapter 4, if you will. And something else he tells us. Tells us he also lied about the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Matthew chapter 4, remember when Jesus was caught up in the wilderness. And he was tempted to the devil. And so he began to, to, to tell Jesus, get this. So the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, you shall, shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it's written, that again, that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And the devil took him up on exceeding high mountain and showed him all, all the kings of the world and their glory. And he said to him, get this. He said and had the gall to say to Jesus Christ. He said, all these things I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. They were his to give. That's right. God had created, God had made it all. But Satan says, I'll give you this if you will bow down to me. Have you ever watched... Oh, brother, where art thou? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the guys are going along in an automobile that they had just stolen. And they come to a crossroads, and, and, and this, this black guy's walking with his guitar, and they stop and pick him up. And they had just, uh, two of them had just went in the water to be baptized. So, anyway. They picked him up and they got to talking and one of them said, I just got saved and I've been baptized in what other names are. I forgot what the names are, but anyway. So Clooney didn't go along with that, but the other guy said, Well, I just sold my soul to the devil. So I sold my soul to the devil. He said, because I wanted to play this guitar and I wanted to be good at it. So I sold my soul to the devil. Well, I, I thought about that. Of course, you, you know, if you've seen the movie, it's kind of hilarious, kind of dumb, kind of, you know, that kind of thing. But it's dumb, good dumb, in a sense. But the thing about it is I sold my soul to the devil. He's thinking that I can do everything because I've given the devil charge in my life. Well, that's what he was trying to do with Jesus. He said, you give me charge of your life and I'll give you this. You know what? He's still saying that today. He's still making it look good to people today. Right. You sell me your soul and I'll give you all of this. Folks, he doesn't have anything to give. It all belongs to God. That's right. Amen. They told Jesus, I'll, I'll just give you all of this. And Jesus finally said, away with this, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. So he's still trying today to sell, uh, tell our people, our family, our friends, our children. He's trying to sell them a bill of goods today and saying, I'll do it if you would just sell me your soul. Satan is a pretty big eye, man. <laughs> I can do this and I can do that. Well, he can do nothing, my friend. But he's still lying today because over in 2 Corinthians, he tells us that he said that eyes of folks are being blinded today. He's blinding eyes, lying to them. Wow. He's causing spiritual blindness. And then the third question that I kind of ask myself, which, as I said earlier, about the aggressiveness of Satan. Do I really believe that Satan is more aggressive today than he's ever been? Yes, I do. I believe he's more aggressive today than he has ever, ever been. Over in 2 Timothy, we find those things that he talks about even in, in latter days and things. But, but I find that he is more aggressive. I think when you're watching a football game or a basketball game or any kind of sporting event, you want to see the aggressiveness out of people, out of those who are playing, participating. Because the more aggressive they get sometimes, the better they can be at what they're doing. And Satan is becoming more and more aggressive. Because the scripture said in perilous times, in the last day, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. And we see that more often today. Men becoming lovers of themselves. And he said, they become lovers of money. They become lovers of money. As I was sharing yesterday at the funeral of Jim Miller, and I, I want to report to you folks that Jim Miller did get saved. Amen. He's 93 years old. 
I talked to my cousin the other day. Who's, they, his daughter, Jeanette's cousin, his daughter took care of Jim for the last year or so. And she said, I called, my, I called her. She said, Tom, you need to talk to my dad because I called him to come over. And so he went over and Ken, he, Ken the boy, his name is Ken, said, Tom said, I've seen a, a great miracle. He said, I, he said, I went there and he said, he was dead. He really was. He's, he was turning blue. And I whispered in his ear and hollered. And finally, he, he, he just woke up. I said, Jim, Jesus loves you. He woke up. Yeah, he woke up. And he told, he told Ken later on, he said, I gave my heart to Jesus. And I'm ready to go home. And he did. But what I'm saying is this, folks. I, I look at that and I think how that... You know, as I told him yesterday at the funeral, I said, you know, I preached on along the lines of things that we're going to leave behind us when we leave here. And we're going to leave all of our earthly possessions. We're not going to take them with us. Not going to. The only person I've ever seen try that was an acquaintance of years and years ago. With her casket, they had so much jewelry and stuff on her that they had guards at the casket at the viewing. But I got news for you, it stayed here. Right. It didn't go with her. So, but, but men sometimes become lovers of money and gatherings and things like that, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with having a lot of money. You just be sure you use it in the right way. Okay? Right. And the best way to do it is go ahead, just go ahead and give it to the church. I'll just throw that in. We'll take it home. Well, we can do the work of the Lord. But men become lovers of money and become so greedy and, and all these things. They don't want to spend a dime. They want to keep it and keep it and keep it. We see that happen. We see them becoming boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient. Get this. And disobedient to parents. Young two people, listen up, please. The Bible says to honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. Amen. Wow, what a commandment with promise. Honor them that your days will be long upon the earth. Yeah. Hmm. We see children becoming disobedient to parents so much. So terrible. Parents... <laughs> Children's rights, they say, but I understand they have rights, but I understand their parents. Oh, that's, another, that's another message. I, up there. I don't have much water to <laughs> But they become disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, uh, hot, hot, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. We see those things happening, don't we? We see that happening every day. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We <laughs> Jeanette and I were talking to somebody last night the other night, and I said, boy, it's kind of amazing. Now, don't get mad when I say this, but it's true. It's kind of amazing we go to the ball game. We sit next to that person right next to us. Arms will be wrapped like this, and we can tell what kind of perfume they have on, and they can tell how many stinks. And we can sit so close together, and we get up with a rail and root and all this stuff for, for a ball team. When we come to God's house, I want my space. <laughs> 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 I just thought I'd throw that in. But we want our space. But it doesn't matter when it comes to the pleasures of life. We get more involved in those than we do in the work of God. We get more involved in, in the pleasures of this, of this world than we do in God's, than coming to God's house. Oh, don't you just wish sometime that sometime we would just yell and root for God the way that we yell and root for our ball clubs. Wow. Satan said, don't do that. Don't do that. You don't want them to think you're a fanatic about Jesus, do you? Oh, yeah. You don't want them to think that you're just a religious nut, do you? Oh, yeah, I do. That's what happened. That's what Satan says because he's so real. He's such a liar. He's such a slander. But they become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. At the first, pleasures of things of life are more are on, the, on their minds more than anything else. Hmm. When's the last time? When's the last time you told somebody how to be saved rather than tell them what the score of the ball game was? Okay, that's enough of that. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof and from such people turn away. So he's saying that, listen, there are people who have a form of godliness and, and devil don't mind you having a form of godliness. He just don't want you to be saved. <laughs> 
He don't want you to be saved. Go ahead, go ahead and go ahead and go to church. Go ahead and have that form of godliness. Go ahead and pretend that you're a good person because the devil says basically you are, and being good is really great. He says, and it is, but there's something missing. The Bible says you must be born again. The devil doesn't see it that way. And so is he more aggressive? Yes, he's more aggressive. Now, you look at the crimes that goes on. You look at the crimes in our society today that, that's going on worse than it's ever been. Can anybody else remember the day when you can leave your house unlocked, you left your windows open, and nobody bothered a thing? I can. Of course, we didn't have much of anybody wanted. I get me, but that was the thing. But you can't do that now. You can't do that. The crimes that go on. And again, we see how it said earlier that, that how that Satan, through his deceitfulness, through his beauty, taking our children through, through with drugs and alcohol and sex and all these other things. Satan does that. Yes, he's more aggressive than he's ever been. Look at more, look at the more, more cults that's, that's in our society and our world today. False religions that's there. False religion, having a form of God, but really denying the power of God. Yeah, he's working big time. If you don't like what the Bible says, I'll just start my own church and do it my way. <laughs> so we see that happening. <coughs> we see the anti-Christian endeavors that's gotten, gotten more serious over the last several years than it's ever been. Anti-Christian endeavors. Oh, it didn't, when, when they took prayer out of, this, out of our school and out of our government, probably praying like that many, many years ago, it didn't seem to bother too many people. But now, it's really bothering us. It really does. It should bother us. Prayer is important. Anti-Christian endeavor to keep us from praying. <laughs> Anti-Christian endeavor to, with no Christian symbols. I can remember... <laughs> There used to be at Christmas time, there used to be manger scenes everywhere. But no, not anymore, because you have one person or two persons that's against that. You can't do that. That's showing you're true Christian. Well, duh. I am. Right. Hmm. You do prayer in school, you do these things, and, and government says you can't do that. We'll sue you. And, and really, they can't. They can sue you all they want to, but the problem is, the problem is, they can, you can still pray. You can still pray. But the problem is, they say, well, we'll sue you. No school wants to fight the system because it takes money. So they back down. Wow. Think about that. But then we look at how the anti-Christian endeavors are, are destroying the sanctity of life by telling us that, hey, that child in that womb is not a baby until it comes out of there. I've got news for you, my friend. The very day of conception, that child, God, is made. Right, right. Yes. Think about this. Anti-Christian endeavors. A, the sanctity, taking away the sanctity of, of, of the family, of home, of marriage. Saying to you and I, you have to honor the fact that man can marry man and woman can marry woman. That's not what the Bible says. That's right. That's wrong. That's sin. But yet, right. it's an anti-Christian endeavor. I was watching the other day, we were watching a the Today Show as we were eating breakfast and, and this couple came on. They had this 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 uh, uh, place up in New York that where it was kind of a retreat place and they would do marriages and now they're being sued because of the fact they refused to do a same-sex marriage because of their belief. But yet, they'll lose. They'll lose. Why? Because the government says and the anti-Christian endeavor the devil, Satan says, push it, push it, push it. So they'll end up having to pay all the money that they're getting sued for because they're going to fail to marry someone with a same-sex marriage. Wow. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that would have ever happened? Well, the devil knew that because that's his anti-Christian endeavor. And so what he can say is, well, you know what you need to do? You don't need to be uh, have that hate for, hatred for homosexuals. I don't have a hatred for homosexuals. I love them. I love their soul. I hate their sin. I hate their sin. Right. I love their soul. That's right. Okay, that's a big difference, folks. Amen. We hate the sin that they're wrapped up in. And I want you to know something. God can do something with it if they'll let you. 
It, it is not people. A lot of the homosexuals will say, God made me that way. No, God did not make you that way. God made you in His likeness and in His image. He didn't make you that way. God made man for, and woman for, man, for each other. But yet I look at that and think, wow, God didn't make it. It's the same way. God didn't make that man a murderer. He didn't make a man a thief. But that's the choice of their lifestyle that Satan says, you do that, it'll be okay. Satan's done. And I love him. I love that guy that's a murderer. I love that guy that's a thief. I love the homosexual. But it's still sin. And no wonder the aggressive of Satan is so powerful. Trying to destroy the sanctity of marriage and the family. So, I thought, what are we to do? What are we to do? I'm glad this morning, as Randy sang that song, that I have an anchor. I have an anchor, folks. Let me tell you, no matter how bad it gets, we have an anchor. And our anchor is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And we're sheltered in the arms of God. We're His. What are we to do? We must remember what he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Wow. Hmm. God gave us the victory over Satan through his son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> look at this. I'm going to close in just a moment. But, but look at this. What he says in, the, in Revelation. <clears throat> when he talks about the victory, that we had the victory over Satan who is so, who is so real... When he says in chapter 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their, love, love their lives to the dead. What he's saying is that we've overcome by the power of the Lamb of God. That's Jesus Christ through His blood. That's how we overcome Satan. Hell celebrated the day that Jesus died on the cross. They celebrated for a while. And on the third day, He came forth. He came, he came forth to give us the victory that we have over Satan. The victory over death, hell, and the grave over in the uh, Colossians, he says this in verse 2, chapter, me, chapter 2 and verse 14, when he said, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Folks, let me tell you, he nails our sin to the cross. He said, yeah, Satan is real, but I beat him. I have won. I've overcome him, and you can too. Why? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You see, that's the key to life. It's knowing that Jesus has died for us. He's been, Satan has been defeated. But beware. Because he's like a roaring lion going about seeking those men in the fire. What do we do? We trust Jesus. We trust God. We realize we have an anchor. And that anchor is Christ. We realize we're sheltered in the arms of God. We're heroes. But beware. Satan is real. He's aggressive. But I'm glad that through the blood of Jesus Christ, he's defeated him. And because he's won, we have won. So this morning, if you're here and you've never known, you don't know Jesus as your Savior, let me tell you something. Satan, you say, well, Satan doesn't bother me too much. Well, he may not have. But he will. Every day. He will entice you with the things of this world. And tossing with things of life and saying you don't need Jesus, but you want you do. Right. You do need Him. Because the Bible says without Him we can be nothing. Without Him, we'd die in our sins. Without Him, we'd have no hope to come alive. So what's He saying to you? So Jesus says, You want victory? And that's how the church has victory today, folks. We have victory because we know. We know. Certainly that one day the church will leave this world victorious. We understand that. But we have victory now because our victory is in Jesus. Is your victory in Him this morning? Father, I pray today that the words you've given me here this morning.